Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Casting Networks live stream. I am Tommy. Our guest today is Ranji Pereira. He is one of four teachers mentored by Martin Barter to teach the Meisner technique. Hi, how's it going? How are you? I'm, I'm good. Good <laughs> to see you again and again. And again. <laughs> I was thinking we could just make this a regular thing once a day, and we'll just, you know, just keep going all day long. <laughs> yeah, you and I will just chat and it'll be super fun. Um, but uh, excited to chat with you. I'm someone that doesn't know a lot about the various techniques. I know of Meisner, but I've never studied it. Um, so my, my knowledge of it is limited. Um, so I'm excited to learn more about it um, and know more about it other than just it's an acting technique you know, developed by Sandy. Like that's, you know, the extent of maybe my knowledge of it in terms of how it works. Um, so I want to talk a little bit uh, about you and your background, how you got started um, and how you got to where you're at today. Great, thank you. Thank you for doing these. It's, it's uh, so, so great to be here and really love what you guys are doing uh, with these talks. So first off, me, Ranji Pereira, I am uh, born and raised in Los Angeles, uh, which is unique for a lot of people in this industry. Um, and I grew up here in LA, loving the entertainment industry. It's just something that I've always been around, going to the theaters and, and you know, movies and everything. Uh, it, I started pursuing and studying acting in the 90s, after high school. And I studied with a lot of different teachers here in Los Angeles, some of them wonderful. Uh, Kim Darby was a big name on camera classes that affected me and, and taught me uh, what, why I would love this craft and uh, the pursuit of this. Uh, there was a teacher in particular though that I met and was working with who came from New York and he was familiar with theater's best kept secret which, by the way, is a documentary that came out in 1990 about Sanford Meisner. Uh, Meisner technique has really blown up in the past 15 years. We'll talk a little bit more about that later uh, and become very popular. But back then, nobody, especially on the West Coast out here in LA, knew about it. If you're in theater in New York, you'd heard about Meisner and technique. But here in LA, no. Most classes, and they still are, are ongoing. You can come and go as you please, you can start and you can stop, and the teacher is recycling or, or you know, reviewing everything they've already done. So uh, this one particular teacher, he had Xerox pages from a book called Sanford Meisner on Acting and brought them into class and shared them with all, all of us students and tried to get us to do this exercise where we stood around across the other person, repeated what the other person was saying. And we had no idea what he was trying to teach us. And most of us laughed, like, okay, whatever. He went on to doing a scene study and all that work. But I took those pages and I read them and I was intrigued. So I hunted down the book, Sanford Meisner on Acting and read that and said, what is this? There's, there's a way to approach acting and learn it at a much more deeper level than what LA classes were teaching me. So I did a little bit more research and found out that there was this place called the Sanford Meisner Center right here in Los Angeles, North Hollywood. And I checked it out and scheduled an interview. Martin Barter, uh, the primary teacher for the Sanford Meisner Center, uh, was my teacher and mentor. I met with him in 2002. This is when I began the training. Uh, he interviewed me. He, we interview all students and explained to me what this program is and I had a little sense of it and read the book, all that. And he said, it's a two year acting training program. You come to class twice a week, you have to rehearse between classes. And I said, what? No, I'm not, no. There's too many other acting classes to take. Do you have a sample? So we, there's another format that this program is taught in. It's called the intensives. It's five weeks of training, five days a week. And I said, I'll do that. Let me check this out. So I did that thinking that's all it would ever be. When I finished the five weeks of training, it was the start of changing everything for me. And I said, I have to complete the training. So Martin moved me into a twice a week program, the traditional first year, which took me another six months to finish training. And I completed that. Then upon invitation, you interview again for the second year training. And I did that, took that on, uh, another interview with him, terrified to move forward, but took it on, did it. And after another nine months of twice a week classes, I completed 
the training of the Sanford Meister technique and became certified by the Sanford Meister Center. It was a big moment. It's most graduates would say it's, it's a pretty big moment in their lives. And it was for me. What it really did for me as an actor was made me realize that all these other classes and teachers I work with were giving me great insights on tips and tricks, right? To your actor's tool belt. Uh, use this one here for auditions, use this one here if you're working on stage, use that one for film versus television or sitcoms. Sure. They were tricks, but not really a foundational level of where, how to work consistently. Um, and it put it all into perspective. And some of the things that I learned from Kim and all the other teachers, I kept, but other, and it modified it, it expanded upon it, and others I let go of because this gave me what I needed. And more importantly, it opened me up as an artist, not just an actor, but the purpose of what artists do. So I went out, got my agent, started uh, doing those 45 minute commutes for the auditions in Santa Monica, five minutes in the room, 45 minute drive back, yeah. and did that route. But what I found and discovered because uh, of uh, my other mentor, my, my first mentor, if you will, Lisa Essery, casting director, I met her and started working for her as primarily a reader. And this was in the mid 2000s. Uh, but she opened my eyes up to the production side of the industry, which I loved. It was left brain, right brain, and it worked, it fit, and I loved it. And we got paid up front as casting directors, which was awesome. <laughs> um, yeah. So she introduced me to that side of it. And she respected my training. She saw that I did a two-year program at the Sanford Meisner Center. Um, and she, being a New York girl, had studied with Stella Adler. So she understood the depth and the work that was put into that. Uh, but I started just as a reader for her in a lot of her projects, but over the years have been her associate and assistant and, and working side by side with her on the projects that she's, um, she's actually given to me to take over. Uh, she's my mentor on that side of the industry, but there was a key turning point working with her early on that I realized about teaching. There was um, a, an actor who we were bringing in the room. I was the reader. She was running the session. He did his scene. She was releasing him and I gave her the look of, can I, can I do something? She said, go ahead, what do you want to work with him? And I gave him a redirect. He came back in, he was happy to do it again. Yes, 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 what? Uh, he did it a second time. And then I gave him another redirect and he was excited to play and do all those things. And the third take, Lisa said, thank you very much. We got everything we need, release the actor. As soon as he was out of your shop, the door was closed. She told me, Ranjiv, we're not here to teach actors. We're casting, but it wasn't because of a time limitation. It wasn't, we gotta keep moving, gotta keep moving. She's yeah. not that. It was what she saw, what I was doing with him was encouraging him when she knew, and I knew in retrospect, he wasn't gonna get this part. Sure. He was okay, but he didn't have the chops to bring out everything that we needed. And there's no, it, it's, it's a detriment to that actor in the room to give him a false sense, uh, especially in the casting situation. And, and I would imagine that would be hard to kind of turn off and just, oh, yeah. especially when you, you know, had that training at Meisner, you're just like, oh, I just, I, I can see something that will help this actor, right. um, but you can't yeah. do that. You have to just yeah. kind of sit back and, and let them succeed or fail on their own, essentially. Exactly. And uh, it, it was a turning point for me, not just in casting and how to streamline it, and not torture actors, <laughs> but to actually realize that teaching and directing is something that I'm naturally drawn to. Uh, so it was in 2009 that I actually went back to Martin. And this is 2000 after the financial collapse, 2007, 2007 2008, where we saw a lot of um, actors who wanted to pursue it say, that's it's not a realistic job. But uh, Martin, who founded the school in 1995 with Sanford Myers, I'll talk about that in the history. Uh, I went back to him and one of the, the gifts that a graduate of this technique gets, once you are part of the fraternity of a Meisner graduate, you can go back and sit in on any of the classes and watch the newbies, the, the young kids still working through it. Um, so I was doing that and I was uh, sharing my experiences in the casting world uh, with him and the students. But uh, Martin at that point had already teacher trained as a first generation teacher, he had teacher trained three of his students. And he didn't think he was gonna continue doing that any further, but I said, it has to, you have to continue. You're, you're a master at this, you're the final teacher to work with Sanford Meisner, you gotta keep teacher training. And I interviewed with him a third time for about an hour and a half, and that was terrifying, to teacher train under him. And what that simply means is as, a, as an apprentice, 
uh, of a craftsman, you're assisting them. I went and got his coffee. I answered the phone when class was in session and it would ring. And I observed, I sat behind him and observed all of his teaching. Going through the program twice, uh, another first year program, the second year program, first year program, the second year program over that four years, watching him reteach it and realizing how much of it is, is it's all just built into it. And we repeat yeah. the same things over and over. It seems like we're you know, winging it all the time, but no, we teach exactly the same thing over and over. What Sandy taught him as a student and as a teacher, he taught me as a student. And then in that four year period of time, taught me to teacher train it. So it was that uh, that changed everything for me as well. I was never intending to, to teach this technique. It's something that happened, happenstance, if you will, or just fate, take your pick. Um, <laughs> Martin relocated up to Seattle, Washington in 2013. That's his hometown. He went from Seattle to New York where he studied with everybody, but Sandy and Meisner was his mentor and his change for everything. And then he came out to uh, Los Angeles with Sanford Meisner and Sandy's partner, Jenny Carvel. Uh, Martin was married at the time with, uh, to Joe Gatsby. And they, they relocated to Los Angeles in 1990 when Sanford Meisner moved out here the final time. And from uh, that point, they, when Sandy moved out here, they landed in Shomer Oaks. Him and Jimmy had an apartment out there. Um, and they were teaching the classes and tenses primarily around different locations in uh, North Hollywood. One of the, the studios they worked out of before getting their own was the Actors Workout Studio. If I remember that's the title name of it, it's still there on Lecture okay. Boulevard. Martin had his classes and Sandy would come over to his classes. Another location that Sandy held classes at was Playhouse West, Robert Carnegie School, which was in existence before Sandy came out the final time in 1990. And Sandy held his classes there. Robert had a chance to observe and watch and teach him the technique, the final version of the technique. But it was in 1995 that uh, Sandy said, let's do our own school, our own theater. And it had two purposes. It was a theater company of Meisner trained actors and they wanted to produce new material as well as traditional con and contemporary work. Uh, but it was, it was a rebirth of what we'll talk about in the history. They wanted to redo what the group theater did back in the thirties. Uh, so uh, they created the Sanford Meisner Center and they found a location on Lancashire Boulevard. Uh, and it was the last location that Sanford Meisner worked out of for the last two years of his life. He passed away in 97, so 95 is when it was founded. Uh, he passed away in 97, his memorial service was held there. Uh, his ashes actually were taken to his summer home in Bequi, West Indies. But Martin continued this training and the theater company, it dissolved over time, but he continued this work that Sanford Meisner left to him uh, there. Uh, for the next 13 years or 18 years until he relocated up in, to Seattle in 2013. Uh, so he does come back down. Uh, when he left, he told me to take over the LA classes, which I've been doing for him. And he comes back down to work with our LA students and also to continue mentoring me, teaching me. Uh, he is overseeing everything that I do because <laughs> he's still my mentor and I'm still yeah. learning from him and I feel incredibly blessed to have that in my life. And sure, I, I bet it's this. great yes. to have that uh, sense of community and, and oh, that's yeah. something that we talk uh, a lot about with actors is you know, finding people who um, can mentor you but also people who can lift you up and make you, you know, feel like you're on the right track or, or possibly give you some feedback, um, collaborate with that sort of thing. Yes. So finding that group, it, it, it really is um, um, not only just for actors, but just in general, for, for people's mental health and, and uh, their stability. There are three techniques um, that form in parallel. So there's the Meisner, Adler, and Strasberg, and there's other techniques as well. Um, can you talk about those and kind of the yes. differences between Absolutely. those? So brief history, uh, it all started back in New York in the 1930s. 1931 was when a group of actors got together uh, Harold Carmen, uh, Cheryl Crawford, and Lee Strasberg. He was one of the founding members of the group theater. There was about 31, 32 members in it. Uh, Stella Adler, who was from a family of actors, and her brother, Luther, I believe. Sandy Meisner, he was an actor. By the way, Sanford Meisner trained uh, first before the group theater in classical piano. Uh, hmm. Pianist, and he trained in that. And according to Martin, he was a brilliant player. Um, the, the group theater formed, 
the, their intention was to produce socially conscious and powerful work. A number of the actors from the group were, had seen um, the Moscow Art Theater, led by a Russian teacher and director by the name of Konstantin Stanislavski. I refer to him as our great great grandfather. He created an approach to teaching acting called the system, which produced a very a lot of depth and reality in the actors. And a number of the group theater actors saw them tour in the US in mid 20s, 1925, 1926, and were really influenced by their work. One of them was Lee Strasberg, who reached out to Stanislavski and said, how do you teach this? How do you teach your actors this system? Stanislavski gave him his notes in Russian. Strasberg had them translated to English. <laughs> and during the group years, which only lasted about 10 years, from 1931 to 1941, this group of actors that came together and were producing their content, Lee Strasberg started to teach them. Stanislavski's approach to acting. And that, in effect, is what's referred to as the start of method acting. It is rooted in Stanislavski's work, the system. Uh, that's the traditional term it's given to. Anybody who creates an acting program or technique derived more directly from Stanislavski, we refer to that as method acting. But these, this group of actors in New York, for this 10 year period of time, it, it became this powerful group of uh, artists that influenced and changed American acting from that point on. The three main ones that came out of it were that the best known, Lee Strasberg, Stella Adler, and Sanford Meisner. There was another significant teacher who came out of the group uh, by the name of Robert Lewis, Bobby Lewis. He also took Stanislavski's work and made his own version of teaching and method acting, if you will, different from Lee. Uh, Lee had the, the, some of the teachers, some of the actors had some contention with Lee's approach in teaching his version of method. Bobby Lewis was teaching at Yale in the 70s, Yale School of Drama, you might have heard of that. And his work heavily influenced theirs uh, and how they teach acting. It is a form of method acting derived again from our great, great grandfather. Stella Adler met with Stanislavski a number of years after uh, Lee worked out of work with him or got his notes and she saw the changes that Stanislavski had done in the system because he didn't come up with it. None of these techniques came up on one night. They evolved over time and even Stanislavski made adjustments and changes to his system, to the system. Uh, so Stella got his notes. She met him in Paris about 1935, got, met with him for about two weeks and learned all the different changes he had and started doing her approach to acting and the Adler technique started to come from that. Sandy was fairly, fairly different. He uh, was invited to teach at the Neighborhood Playhouse in New York. The Neighborhood Playhouse is a conservatory program. It's okay. a school that teaches performing arts. So they have acting, they have voice for singing, they have movement, dance. And nowadays they include on camera classes and that they still exist. The Neighborhood Playhouse is still in New York and it is considered it is the original home of the Meisner technique. Why? Because in 1936, Sanford Meisner, 1935, 1936, they asked him to be the head teacher of their acting program. So from that point on, he was working from mid 1930s to 1990 when he left the neighborhood playhouse, crazy. He evolved into being their head uh, uh, acting teacher, the head of it and teaching all the other teachers who taught acting there as well. And this, this is where the Meister technique evolved. Again, it didn't happen overnight. He didn't come up with these exercises immediately. Didn't He's just roll out of bed and come up with that. Right, it didn't happen that way. He, he went to teach other actors from his own experience as an actor as part of the group theater. Yeah. So over that 60 year period of time, he was developing and evolving and coming up with exercises, dropping them, replacing them with new ones and the technique evolved. And that is true for the other two master techniques, the other, the three major master techniques, which went on from there to pretty much influence all of American acting. I think that that's important to note because so often it's like, oh, well, this person developed an acting technique and they, they just came up with it, you know, or you wonder like, where did this come from? Or it just is something that they, um, you know, developed in a week, but when you see it as something that took years and decades to create and probably at the beginning, you know, was completely different than where it, where it ended up. 
figured it out. Um, you know. I would say it's completely different. It grows, it evolves. Yeah. It took their brilliant minds to do that work, their, their, their need to, to build that. But yeah. those three techniques, they're very similar. Um, the, the thing I like to say is the three grandfather techniques, the end result is an emotionally open and truthful actor. Yeah. To the lay person, to the audience, they don't see the difference between an Adler, a Meisner, or a Strasbourg actor. Right, yeah. But the trained eye, those who know the techniques, can say, oh, yeah, 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 you, you, you studied Adler, didn't you? <laughs> or you're definitely a Meisner actor. Uh, there are subtleties in it because the approaches are pretty different. I like to put Strasbourg on one side, uh, Sandy Meisner on the other side, and Stella in the middle. I say that her work actually complements the other two beautifully. Um, and if you, there are actors who say, I'm going to study all three. I'll take the six I was ask about that. programs from each one and make my own technique. Well, <laughs> it doesn't really work that way because technique isn't um, a set of tricks and tips and tools. It's not about giving an actor, well, you're going to use this only when you're auditioning. You're going to do this when you're working on stage. That's not what technique is. Technique is developing a foundation from where you do your work. And that foundation becomes an ability, one that you don't think about when you're actually doing it. You trust it. It's, it's as I like to say, you're, you're working acting muscles you don't even know you need. Yeah. Uh, it's that muscle memory, right? Sandy got it when he did scales, learning, learning to play the piano. And that's, uh, athletes get it too. Yeah, that's a, a great way to, um, to describe it. Like when you're learning the piano, you're learning sheet music, you're learning the basic, um, notes and then over time you develop you can kind of you know be a rock pianist but you have to learn the basics first before you can before you can jump to improvise exactly <laughs> the improviser to, to, to even yeah. try to play Chopin right yeah right. if you just go to it it becomes mechanical it becomes bland once you've developed the underlying uh, fundamentals of how to work with the keyboard and the piano or whatever instrument then you approach that work, you bring yourself to it. And that's yeah. ultimately what technique really does well. And many modern acting programs out there, uh, they don't reinvent the wheel. They're, they're not revolutionary. If anything, Stanislavski's work was revolutionary. To, to some extent, even Sandy, Adler and uh, Strasberg's work were, were taking his original work and building upon it. Um, nobody today is really coming up with anything. Oh, wow, this is a whole new approach to acting. And when you know the three grandfather techniques, you can see what all the current modern teachers who write their books about their technique, what they've taken from the masters and modified it or added to it. So nobody's changing too much. These, the, that, the, the actors that came from the group were the most influential actors to, to change American acting. And it's been around for going on over a hundred years now. So. Um, did that cover the history? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Uh, and, and there's, I didn't want to touch real quick. I yeah. forgot Sanford Meisner did leave the neighborhood playhouse from 1958 to 1964. This was the first time I mentioned that. This is the first time he came out to LA, to Los Angeles. Um, he was hired by what now is 20th Century Fox Studios to head up the new talent division. And during that time, he also worked in film, he acted. Uh, but it gave him a chance to really learn the Hollywood system and the process that, that happens. And a lot of people say or, or think these ancient grandfather techniques are all about working on stage, that they had no idea. I mean, what did they know about film and television? Actually, Stella Adler also did a lot of uh, film herself. She came from a family of actors. So they did understand film. It's, it's, these techniques aren't just for stage work. Uh, they're about learning the craft of acting where can you do that craft, whether it's an audition room, stage, in front of a camera, a single camera, or multi-camera, your acting is the heart of your craft. You'll make technical changes to adjust for the medium that you're working in. But the craft of acting is the same. Uh, and that's an important distinction, but Sandy, for a six year period of time, uh, came to Hollywood. He returned in 1964 to head up the, the neighborhood playhouse, the acting over there. And from 64 to 90, he continued teaching. During that time, uh, the Meisner estate recognizes 21 teachers, first generation teachers that Sanford Meisner teacher trained. He said, 
you were first a student, you should teach this technique. Here, learn how to teach it, study at the neighborhood playhouse, assist me and go. Uh, of those 21 teachers, there's 11 that have already passed. And some of them started working with him in the 40s and the 50s. Uh, of the remaining 10, there's about five that are actually still teaching. And of all of them, not everybody teacher trained. Not all of those first generation teachers taught other students to continue this, this technique. Martin's uh, one of the more prolific, but the most prolific was William Esper, Bill Esper out of New York. He actually passed away last year, 2019. And he has a lot of second generation teachers under his wing, under his training. Uh, he actually headed the drama department at Rutgers University for a number of years from, I believe, 19, 1970, 70 something, in the 70s. He headed the drama department there. And a lot of students who studied theater at Rutgers University got firsthand experience of the Miser technique because their acting training was rooted because of the less work in that. College level training usually touches on these master techniques. If you study theater in college, you've heard about Meisner, you've heard about Usually Adam. a course of it, yeah. Or they they about touch it. on it, yeah. but there's no way in a four-year college program they can teach you all of those techniques sure. in completeness. So usually the, the method, the approach that is being taught is rooted in who heads up the drama department. Again, uh, Robert Lewis, Bobby Lewis, Yale's School of Drama. His approach to method acting, Stanislavski's work, influenced all of their work. So that's, at the college level, a number of our students, I would say about at least 40% of our students already have a college degree. And of those, more than half study theater. And they come to us because they had some experience in Meisner, whether at the college level or outside, and they're diving into it to take so them. Do you um, rarely see actors who have no acting background at all come to you? Um, yes. Or, it does yeah, what's your clientele, I guess? Or um, clientele's a weird way to put it, but what's your student? Uh, <laughs> Every so often we get that person who has always had that feel that they, they, they would love to try acting to see right. if it's the right thing for them. Uh, during the interview process that we have, these things come up and the common answer is, well, then go try an acting class, especially here in Los Angeles. There's throw, throw something you're going to get an acting <laughs> Yeah, there's, there's some. Yeah, take, take one. Um, yeah. I usually recommend take an on-camera class just to mm -hmm. see yourself and see if you really like this. And if it is, find out if you need it. Because yeah. if you need it, that's when you know you're going to put in the work to get it. Right. So people who are just trying it out to see if acting is right, this isn't, and not just Meisner, any of those serious techniques, it's not the way to find out. The techniques are meant for people who know that this is what they must have. This is right. what they have to do. This, I need to be an actor in my life. I need to be an artist and I need to make that into a career. So that's usually what happens. And we've had musicians uh, <laughs> in this work because performance on stage uh, and, and music is its own artistry in itself. We get uh, directors and writers who want to study this technique because again, it opens up their artistry while they're learning acting. It does so much more than that. And, and there's different versions of the Meisner technique, right? So there's, yes. it's, it's not just, you know, this is the technique. There's different versions of that. Mostly because it changed over time it grew and evolved. Now, there are those who have taken exercises from the technique and created ongoing classes, right? So mm -hmm. again, fitting the LA audience, it's a good business model, you can come and go as you please. It wasn't the way that it was designed to be taught, uh, and not, not that intention. But putting, putting those types of classes aside, there are variations of, there's a lot of people say we teach the authentic version of the Meister technique. Well, it depends on uh, at what point did the teacher, if it's a first generation teacher, when did they stop working with Sanford Meisner? Because he continued to build and evolve the technique, drop exercises, add new ones. If that first generation teacher left him early on, they only had that version of it. Interesting. They might have yeah. heard of the later exercises that came into play, uh, but they weren't there when they were developed and honed and added into the technique. So the variations in those who say, <laughs> 
which is the most authentic version of it, it really comes down to at what point did they stop working with Sanford Meisner in his uh, life, in his development of the technique. And th those variations are out there. They're out there. It doesn't make what they're teaching any less important. It's just, um, it can be confusing to a lot of people. Well, what's the most authentic? You know, that question comes up a lot for us. Well, who's the most authentic? Well, well, how do you define it? What do you want in authenticity? And ultimately, that's not even as important as who you choose to study with. This journey, this, this training is uh, pretty powerful and pretty deep. And you do have to trust the guide that's taking you through it. We, we, Martin likes to call us guides. We are taking you up this huge mountain that you can't even see the top yet, but we're gonna get you to the top. We're gonna to teach you how to climb it. You're doing all the heavy lifting. And once you get to the top, you'll work your way back down and you don't need us anymore to go back up that mountain again. Have, have you um, experienced situations where you and a student, maybe it, it just feels like that's not the right connection? Like obviously you're good at what you do and obviously you're trained and you have that thing that's like, there's something with this student that I, you and I are not connecting and maybe there's another teacher that you can work with better and has nothing to do with either you or that person. It's just a matter of personalities and working together, right? Right. It, it happens and that's what the interview process is really about. It's not just for us to get to know you, but you to get to know us. And in that interview, I've had students say, I don't believe you're the right teacher. Which, good that you caught that now. Yeah. And more often it's us saying, I don't know that this is the right school for you, which is the other way of saying, yeah, I mean, look, part of it is yeah. we're committing to working with you twice a week, three hours in class for the next nine months. I got to like you somewhat. <laughs> yeah. I spend that much time with you. <laughs> right. Yeah. You got you to gotta be able to, you know, connect and jive and, and, and feel like at the end of this course, because it's, uh, it's not continuous. Like at the end of this, I can see where, you know, oh, yeah. where I can get you. And if you feel like you can't see that, that's why I think it's great to have an interview process and not just take anyone and just work with anyone. Um, just make sure that I, I feel confident that I can get you value out of this. And if Absolutely. you don't feel like you can get value, then it's almost unethical to just be like, yeah, I'll just, you know, I'll take you on. And even though I feel like it's not going to work out. No, it, it is, it, and it shouldn't right. be. So it's it's unethical, but it's a waste of everybody's time. Right. Whose time? The students' time and the other students' time as well. Yeah. You you want to build a class and a group of students that have the same vision and the same goal, and yeah. we work together. And that's again actually one of the more unique aspects of the Meisner technique when it's taught in the traditional way. It's one primary teacher taking the same group of students from beginning, middle to end. When you study uh, the Strasbourg Institute or the Adler Institute, there are multiple teachers teaching different aspects of it. You're giving a curriculum, take this class, this class, this class in this order, and after two years, you, you're trained in their techniques. Meisner and the development of this technique was different than that. Uh, while it was developed in a conservatory program, the acting portion, which is lifted out of what the conservatory you know, class and all the different classes are, when it's taught by itself, it's really one of the most unique acting training programs out there. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, that, that cohesiveness and a connection. If students are coming to us only because they hear, well, you teach the magic technique, you're the final ones, but they don't like us, it doesn't work. Right. It doesn't work. It's a waste of time. So um, I, I hear this a lot with Meisner, the reality of doing. Yeah. So I want to know what that is, what that mm -hmm. means, and yes. uh, if you could uh, um, explain that a little bit. The reality of doing. Um, <laughs> The seed of our acting, the foundation of our acting is the reality of doing it. It's one of the very first lessons in the first class. It's, it's trying to get a new actor to shift their mindset. Um, a lot of actors, or even lay people, not just actors, but people who watch them on television, believe that the job of an actor is to pretend to be somebody else. You're playing a character, right? In, in an imaginary circumstances, you're, you're not you, you're pretending to be something you're not. And that very sentence right there, the reality of doing is trying to shift your mindset away from that concept of pretending to be something you're not to, no, it's me. 
really doing this right here, right now. It's that very, it seems like a simple concept, but until you put it into action, it doesn't fully make sense. But once the actor starts to do that, they are evolving out of this, I'm just playing in things. I don't really have to feel anything. I don't have to really do anything. I just have to make it look real to the audience. That's a level of acting that isn't us. And it only gets, so, gets you so far as an actor. The, the concept, the reality of doing is a tenant that really is a start. Of, this is what this technique is going to do for you. You're going to learn how to live truthfully under these given imaginary circumstances. So you're really doing things. And when you really commit to doing something 100%, not 98%, not 20%, 100%, a lot of your fundamental truths come forth. And we don't have to act that. We don't have to work to show that I'm a, I'm, I'm a real a competitive asshole and uh, I will always beat out other people. Or I'm a deeply empathetic person who needs other people to be as successful as I am. And these simple traits, basic human traits that each individual encompasses really comes out when you simply commit to doing something. You don't yeah. worry about it. You don't worry about how you're presenting yourself. You're really just doing. And it's one of the, it, that sentence encompasses so much of what the technique does and teaches. Another huge aspect of it is when you're committed to real, just really doing something, you're not worried about you. Your yeah. focus and attention is on the task at hand or the person at hand. I really have to break up with them because I'm done with this relationship. All right, well, that is about you and them, but you're actually doing something. And there's that heightened level too. Uh, drama, acting, scenes. It's not about, more, more often than not, it's not about everyday life. It's heightened moments of life. And in those heightened moments, when the house is on fire, when you're running late for your sister's wedding, right? You're really going to be doing things. And it's in right. that doing that your truth comes out. So it's, it's a very simple sentence and statement, but it's more of a setup of what this technique is going to do to you. It's going to change you to focus, to dedicate, to discipline yourself, to really doing something 100%. And when you do, you don't worry about yourself. Yeah, and it's, uh, it's you know, we talk about this, but it's less just that that person is acting, that yep. you get lost in that character and you're like, oh, I totally, totally believe that that person is that character and they're not a real person in real life. Right. Um, you know, that they are... Um, yeah, you get lost in it. And the miser so, uh, technique. One of the words that we don't use is actually character. <laughs> character, yeah. There's, it's that separation. It's, right. I'm not playing a character. I'm not pretending to be somebody else. It's just me doing that. Sure. And yeah, we, we change that. You're, you're in a role. You're in a role. Yeah. When, you, when that mindset shifts over into, oh, wow. Okay, it's just me doing this, and I'm going to do it 100%. I'm really doing it. I'm really reading the book. I'm really packing the suitcase because I got to go. I got to finish this book to pass that test. When you're really doing it, the audience will believe you. Yeah, I and love you that. got something to do. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's so, that's the easiest way to describe what the reality of doing is. And in addition to that, the Meisner technique stresses improvisation, which is something that is really important for actors to learn, especially with auditioning. Um, how can an actor lose their self-consciousness and just kind of be more in the moment and be able right. to improvise and... Um, so let me clarify that. There's um, what a lot of actors learn is you should take that comedic, comedic improv class. Uh, especially the commercial work. It's very important because it allows you to stay alive and, and change up things on the fly. Uh, this is different. We don't do comedy improv. We do a structured form of improvisation. What does that mean? So um, the technique is the entire first year, nine months of training, you're learning a major block. And in that, once you've learned it and you've done some work on it to understand it, you now practice it what we refer to as the structured improvisation exercise. Uh, we actually call it activities, but it is a form of structured improvisation, which means there's no script, there's no text that you're given. You are creating it, you and your partner are working off of each other and 
adjusting to whatever happens between the two of you, thus the improvisational aspect. But it is very guided. You're, you're, it's not willy nilly. It's not, yeah, you're here to make people laugh and just do anything. It's not that. It, it's, it's what I like to refer to as a structured improvisation. We have very specific guidelines that you follow in order to practice this huge block that you've just been taught. And in that practice, you develop it and strengthen it. And all through that, your focus, your dedication, your concentration is on the other person. It's not on you. So you're also conditioning yourself to let go of the self-consciousness. Trust your work. When that becomes second nature to the actor, it frees them up to do so much more. So yes, there's, there's a key difference. There's that comedic improvisation and what we do. There's a lot of similarities. The biggest one is it's not scripted. That's the biggest one. But there's a lot more structure in the way that Sandy uh, took improvisation and applied it to his technique and his work. Um, there, a lot of students ask, so is it, do I get to do whatever I want? No, no. You're going to be given these guidelines and you follow them. You do that. When you do that, it builds these acting muscles that you didn't even realize you needed. And um, if you search Meisner online, one of the things that you're going to see a lot is the repetition exercise. Yeah. And so if you just stumble upon that, I think a lot of people are like, what is this? What are they doing? What is, what is the purpose of this? So I'm well, curious if you could <laughs> explain yeah. that. What is the repetition exercise? Why do actors do that? Why is that important? Yeah. An important aspect of the Meisner technique. Uh, again, uh, it's strengthening acting muscles you don't even know you need. The most basic one that people realize is training you to listen. Listen to the other person. Put your focus and attention on them. And right there, by putting your focus and attention on the other person, you're not worried about yourself. So that one element of that self-consciousness is already in the second class of the program where you start repetition. It's already starting to, we're, work, we're working on that. Are you self-conscious when you're up there doing repetition? Absolutely, every actor is. Do I look right? Do I sound right? How, all of that, right? We got to eliminate that. So how do you do it? Put your focus on the other person. Repeat what they're saying. So at a very basic level, that's it. But here's a, a more weird understanding of it. It's not weird. It's, it's Martin's way of describing the power of repetition. It's the language of the Meisner technique. What does that mean? As a kid, you learned your ABCs. Right, usually in kindergarten, preschool, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. As you grow older and you start learning words and you've been talking already, but now you're reading. And now you can take all these bigger words and form sentences. So are you still thinking about ABCs when you're doing that? No. The ABCs are the foundation of our language, English, our language, <laughs> my language. <laughs> it's the foundation of language, our English language. I don't wanna, I wanna be more inclusive. Um, Repetition is that, that alphabet for the Meisner technique. It is maintained. There are Bill Esper's variation of the Meisner technique says, oh, we don't repeat after the first six weeks. We drop that. Well, that's not what Sanford Meisner did. He maintained it throughout the entire first year. It evolves. It evolves and it starts to drop off automatically by the students into the second year. But it has been developed as such a fundamental alphabet for a, a, a way for two actors to communicate that becomes second nature and you stop thinking about it. So repetition is training at the very beginning levels just to listen to the other person, put your focus on them. But again, it's building all these other fundamental necess necessary acting muscles to take you even further. Did that answer it? Did that, that definitely answered the question. Um, <laughs> no, because I, I see that and I'm just like, okay, I, I'm not 100% sure what they're going for, but obviously there's a, a method to the madness, right? Exactly. Um, they're, 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 there's they're a purpose that. to it. And the graduates who come back and sit in on classes, they usually have that epiphany of, that's why we did that. <laughs> yeah, sure. Because when you're going through it, you have no clue. As yeah, a student, sure. you don't know why you're doing this. It's only in the reflection when you see how all of it adds up and creates this foundation that you work from. Because we don't throw anything away. Every step, every block of this 
this technique that you learned is building on the previous one. Again, it's not, well, that repetition is only for auditions. You won't use it for a film. What? No, that, that's not what it is. Yeah. And it's, that's what a, a good acting technique does. It builds this foundation and keeps building upon it. Um, Sandy talked about anticipating. Uh, mm -hmm. So I want to know, why is that a bad thing? Most actors don't anticipate from a, a place of reality, the reality of doing, right? Uh, I believe they're supposed to come to the door. I'm waiting here at, in, in my studio for that student to show up so I can reprimand them, right? That's the scene. Right. So that's anticipation within the reality. What actors tend to do is anticipate the next line, right? You're supposed to say this and you're supposed to say it that way. That's not reality in the imaginary circumstance. It's an actor thinking of what is coming up next from an acting standpoint. That level of anticipation has to go away. Spontaneity, spontaneity. Actually being surprised by somebody bursting through the door, even though they've done it eight times this week, because we're in a play, right? And we're yeah. doing this play eight times a week. How do you not anticipate that? How do you make it real and spontaneous? And it is a challenge. It's a huge challenge. I mean, how about the simple fact that most work that actors do, it's scripted, it's a lie. You're so, you know yours, and you may know, especially if you're in a play, eight times a week. You know what the other actor's going to say. You cannot anticipate that. How do you do that? It's all built into the technique. Because, again, it's a pit, it's, it's a trap. Uh, it's a problem that actors face all the time. The more you do it, the more it becomes easier not to anticipate. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, I want to get into some of the emailed questions, um, sure. if, if that's good with you. So one of the first ones we got was, do you recommend any books on acting? So I know Sandy had a book. Um, Spectrum Miser on Acting. Uh, <laughs> yeah. It was actually written by Dennis Longwell. Uh, and it was, was uh, Sandy did not want a book that explained the technique. He was afraid people would try to learn to act from a book or worse, teach from a book. The, the format of the of Sam for Miser on Acting is as though you're, you're in the class as a student and you're listening to his conversations and the teachings that he does. And it covers all the fundamentals of the Miser technique, but it doesn't go into any of the details. It doesn't go into any of the details. Um, for example, there's uh, one particular step called emotional preparation. And it's talked about in the book. It's talked about in the book how an actor needs to start from an emotionally full place. We don't start any of our work or scenes from an emotionally neutral place. Once you learn that step and you develop it and strengthen it and exercise it, every time you step onto the stage in front of the camera, you're gonna be emotionally full. And he has that solution. And it's talked about in the book, but the detailed steps of how to actually do it are purposely left out. So it's a good book to introduce you to deeper concepts of the mindset tech. Other books, um, well, here's, here's one, of my, my, one of the things I really push. Uh, we do cover script interpretation or scene interpretation in the second year. It's not touched on in the first year. First year is about opening you up as an emotional human being, letting you discover what you're capable of. And if, if you teach analysis is what a lot of people call it, script analysis. You teach that too early on, all it does is put the actor into their head. It doesn't activate the heart, the gut, the soul. It's safe for the second year. But there's, there's a, it's a, it's a three-hour lecture. It's a full class. And we cover a lot of tips that many actors would listen to and go, wow, I never thought of looking at text that way or the script that way. But the actors who are avid readers of fiction, they're fans of fiction. And most of us know somebody who's a bookworm, right? They got their Kindle, they're always reading a book, they're always talking about the book. And I'm not talking about self-help books or books on acting. Fiction, novels, which are an art form in and of itself. And people who read avidly, readers, are very good at A, reading fast, and B, interpreting the written word, what the writer intended. That's fundamentally script interpretation. That's a skill a skill necessary as an actor, and many actors don't have it. So they rely on classes to how do you analyze the text, or, or you pay a coach. 
you got your audition or you booked the job and you've poured over the, the, the script, but you want to make sure you've got all the nuances. So you pay a coach to help you break it down and analyze it. It's money. It's time. One of the best skills you can build and strengthen on your own is to read fiction. Yeah. Read your self-help books. Read your books on acting. Learn, by all means. But you can't learn a craft like acting from, a, from reading. you got to yeah. do it. No, that's great. I, you don't want to... If you have 20 books that you're going to read, probably not the best idea to just read 20 books just on acting technique. You want to be a well-rounded person. And that's what casting is looking for all the time. They're looking for someone that knows history and, and, yep. and reads fiction and, and, and kind of is a well-rounded person because that resonates in the room. The best um, artists are, exactly. Yeah, yeah. The best artists are well-rounded. They, they, they have, do, do, you know, Martin is a huge history buff. And you dive into other things. It makes you exactly what you said, well-rounded. Yeah. It's a more interesting person. Can't tell you how many times I've had a casting director say that, you know, they're nice, but they're very actory. <laughs> they're just like, they're, you know, um, which is not necessarily something that you always want to come off as you want to come off as, you know, a real person, not, you know. It's, it's a single mindedness. When you're yeah. only focused on one thing, it does make you a bit shallow. Yeah. yeah. Um, do you have any helpful tips for memorization? Ooh, okay. Um, do what works for you right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So memorization, first off, it's another muscle. It is a muscle. And uh, if you're not the photographic memory, right? There are some people who are. They can look at the text and have it in five minutes. And the rest of us hate that. Uh, but if you're pretty average like everybody else, you have to work at it. And memory is a muscle. It is a muscle. Sandra Bison, this technique, has a very, very, very clear and specific way to approach text. We're taught it. Uh, I call them the cornerstone elements of this technique. But it only works when you're doing it within the technique. Um, and one of the fundamental purposes of it is to make sure you don't have what's referred to as lying. So you're set in the way of saying it. You're set in, this is the way it's always going to be set. And the other actor should say it that way, which means I'll say it back this way. No, okay. So most actors today, if you've done some research, already know that that's not a good approach to acting. And they want to find different ways. Well, it's covered in the technique. Uh, the, the, all the major techniques are covered. But to better improve your memorization muscle itself, practice. Take a, take a paragraph. This is what I teach my kids. Who, if anybody who struggles with memorization, they take longer than the rest of their classmates to get their text buried. Practice it regularly. Go to Wikipedia, whatever the highlighted topic of the day is, click it, take the first paragraph, and hopefully it's something so boring that you don't care about it, and force yourself to memorize it. Practice. Yeah, yeah. that's, uh, you just got to keep doing it, keep at yes. it. Um, should, I take Meisner courses before seeking representation or after? <laughs> um, hmm. That has changed. Uh, Sanford Meisner, back in the day, no good playhouse, didn't want to work, actually said, if you're studying with me, you don't go and work. If you're on hiatus from your show, you can study with me. You, you don't go and, and pursue the, 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 the career of acting. That changed over time. Martin tried to maintain it here in Los Angeles, but he had to change and adjust over time as well because we had more and more working actors coming to study this to advance their careers. So if you are just starting off, you don't have an agent or manager, you don't even know how to approach that. Well, I've added those instructions into this technique. I say this is from Ron G, not from Martin, not from Sandy. Uh, traditionally, anything about the industry, the career and pursuing it is taught traditionally only at the end of the, right near the end of the second year. Uh, Martin brought in a graduate to teach my class in 2000, right near the end of the second year about headshots. Many of us already knew, some of us didn't. It's up to you when you're actually going to pursue having the career. And can you be training this technique to deepen it while you are a working actor? Yes, we have plenty of those already. While you're a working director, while you are a stunt woman, one of our current second year students, she's been doing stunt work for eight years and she works. She's still doing her stunt work, but she's training this at the same time. She has her agents and managers for stunt work. She wants to expand beyond that. 
if you're brand new, the answer to somebody who asks me, a new student who doesn't have a career started, should I start pursuing the career now? The answer is, or do you feel you're ready? Based on everything you've learned, you have to make that decision. You have to make the decision if you're going to do it or not. As long as you don't let it interfere with your training, what you do outside of here is in our business. Right. That's, that's the key. You have to know when you're ready. And to look for a teacher or an agent or a casting director or a friend to say, you're ready. You should be getting that agent and go out there and work. You're not going to have a career. You got to have, you got to find it in yourself to push yourself to have a career. If you don't have it, if you're waiting for the approval or the affirmation from outside, trust me when I say you won't survive. Yeah. And how long did you uh, work in casting? I still do. Um, still? I started with Lisa ooh, 2006, 2007. So going up 14 years now. So this question's related to that. What's your biggest takeaway from working in casting? I love it. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Part of it because we get paid up front. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, it, the casting work really appeals to both the left brain and the creative side. Uh, it, there, there's, a, there's a common thing I hear. A lot of actors who take workshops with casting directors, uh, you know, either to, to get in front of them or learn from them. Uh, the, the, the common thing you'll hear is casting directors don't know what they're looking for. They want you, the actor, to show them the role. To that, I say, I, I won't use a four letter word. Uh, <laughs> no, no, I was hired. I read the script. I love the script. I have a vision for it. It's in alignment with the writer and the director and the producers, which is why they hired us. Yeah. That doesn't mean we are closed minded. Right. In fact, our job as counsel is to be as open minded as possible. And we actually tend to fight, usually as the writer who created their universe. They know these characters so intimately, they only have one vision. So couldn't, couldn't she be blonde instead of brunette? No, no. <laughs> yeah. that, that's the fight that we have time to have, but it's such a creative and fun process. Um, it is about, we do know what we're looking for, but when we get an actor in the room that shows us something we didn't expect, it's such a brilliant moment. Especially, yeah. well, only if we believe you. If you yeah. believe it and you bring us something that we never saw that scene or that role doing, we go, holy crap, I never saw it that way. Thank you. Yeah. Now, can we go this direction just to make sure you can take the direction? <laughs> so it's so creative. And um, it, it's part of the creative process early on that yeah. I really enjoy about that. And yeah. again, I, I wouldn't have ever touched it if I hadn't met Lisa Essery. She, she mentored me and taught me that side of the industry. And I, I, I went to it just to learn about that side of the industry, but she made me fall in love with it. You got to love what you do. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Um, so curious what the Sanford Meisner Center is doing currently. And, you know, we're in the midst of a pandemic. And so um, uh, curious what you're up to now and, and, and if there's any, anything that actors can, can do regarding uh, Meisner on hold on in-person classes uh, here in LA County or the rest of the country. Um, we are on hold. We do not have any in-person classes. We have shifted all of our current students to doing work online. And that online work is not, we do not teach the Meisner technique online. We don't feel the technology is capable of doing that. Um, we don't believe in that. But what we can do is maintain our students to be ready to come back to work as soon as the work starts coming back. And the first step to that is self-tape auditions. So uh, we are actually now, we've been doing that with our current students and some pending students, it's just self-tape work. And that's from my casting background. We give you the material, we review it. And it's, it's again, it's not about teaching you the acting. Each actor is doing their own work, but it's about clarifying what you have to have ready, what you need to be able to do on a moment's notice to get that self-tape turned in as quick as possible. Not an hour before the deadline. <laughs> <laughs> right. Spread it around as quick as possible. So it's exercising them to keep them active and busy. And uh, we do lecture as well. Uh, things, information that can be passed on. But training, the craft of acting, we don't feel that this technology can really 
it's a disservice to the student to try to teach them that. You'll, you'll build bad habits. Um, and it's unrealistic. There's, there's no stage work that you'll ever be working with your partner on a laptop. Yeah. So um, yeah, we, we are on hold and training of the Meister technique until we can return back to in-person classes. We were hoping that would be in September, but everything that's happening in the world, we don't see it happening right now. We don't know. We just don't know when it can. We don't want to restart to have to shut down. Right. Uh, we do get a lot of international or out of state people who come, especially for the intensives. And that, we don't want them to relocate to Los Angeles for five weeks only to turn around. Uh, right before the right. pandemic hit, March 16th, we were starting the level one intensive. We had a student who had come out a week and a half before from London for that intensive. And she had to grab a plane back right before the lockdown happened. And she made it back home, but that, you know, it's really uncertain times right now. Well, I'm sure, you know, everyone's anxious for that to get back and running. So when that does happen, definitely let us know and we'll let all the talent know that, you Absolutely. know, that's something that is uh, back up. Um, we are out of time. This was wonderful. Thank you so much for spending an extended amount of time with me today. Um, do you have any last words before we end? Thank you, Tommy, for A, the opportunity and for doing this. Again, during this bizarre time in the world uh, to keep actors motivated. I have been pleasantly surprised by how many people haven't freaked out and said acting's a pipe dream. Yeah. Because this really just feels like a pause. And plenty of people who feel they need to be an artist are on hold. Most all of our students don't give up. Yeah. Art, right now, what do we need more in the world than anything is, is escapism, is art to keep us entertained and informed yeah. and challenged. So uh, I'm glad that it, it, it doesn't feel that it's you know big, oh Lord, the world is gonna end and there's gonna be no television anymore <laughs> or stage, right? Stage right. is frozen. Um, it's gonna come back and We've been here forever. We're going to continue doing this. So when it's back, we'll all be back. Sounds great. Thank you so much, Ranjeev. And um, we'll talk later. All right. See you later, everybody. <laughs>